Hello, listeners. This episode originally aired in April of 2016, and we're rebroadcasting it because it features Google's general counsel, Kent Walker, discussing the fine balance between needs for encryption versus government access and security. Stay tuned. We hope you enjoyed the episode. Welcome to In-House Legal, where we cover a variety of issues pertinent to the general counsel and in-house legal departments of small, mid-size, and large organizations. Join host Randy Milch each month as he discusses the latest developments, trends, and best practices for this very busy and often complicated area of law. You're listening to Legal Talk Network. Hello, my name is Randy Milch, and I'm the host of In-House Legal on the Legal Talk Network. I'm honored and happy to have as a guest today Kent Walker, Senior Vice President for Legal, Policy, Trust, and Safety at Google. Kent is a son of Silicon Valley whose succession of increasingly important jobs in the tech industry tracks the evolution of technology over the last two decades. From disruption to censorship, there's a lot to cover, so let's get started. Kent, welcome to In-House Legal. Thanks very much, Randy. It's great to be with you here today. So let's spend a few minutes on your career because you have actually had a fascinating one in Silicon Valley. You're a native there, but after law school and after a short stint in private practice, you went into the U.S. Attorney's Office. What made you decide to go that route? Well, I'd always been interested in in public affairs and and the opportunity to be involved in public law. In fact, when I was working for a law firm, a lot of the work I was doing was with government clients in the U.S. and, and overseas. So there was always that interest. And then the opportunity to be directly involved in trying cases in matters that I felt were important and interesting, I was just too good to turn away from. So I had a a five-year stretch uh, with the Department of Justice, including both being a prosecutor in the courtroom and then working back on uh, broader policy issues in what's called main justice in Washington, D.C. So there's a lot of discussion, Kent, you know, among uh, gray hairs in the legal profession to the younger folks about their first job out of law school and the kind of training they ought to get. Was it your perception that the U.S. Attorney's Office provided that kind of overall training that's so valuable for a younger lawyer? Well, I think there are a whole variety of different things you you want to be trained on. I think of the, the different components of what a lawyer needs to do. We need to manage projects. We need to work well with people. We need to be good at articulating uh, points of view, both orally and in writing. You pick up different aspects of that, different ways you know, along the path. And I'm not sure there's one great source of training for that. Law firms have organized training programs, and sometimes those can be useful. But in many cases, there's a quality of learning by doing uh, that you can only get when you have the experience yourself. I remember the first time I got up to, to try a case and feeling so nervous I wasn't sure I was going to be able to, to go through with it. But by the time you've done it 20 times, you develop a, a certain muscle memory. So it's, I think you take your training where you can find it. It's something working in the Department of Justice, which is, in a sense, the world's largest law firm, is fascinating, uh, both from a practical perspective and from an operational perspective, as you see how a large organization deals with complex issues. Well, we'll get back to your prosecutorial background later, because I think it's an interesting uh, set of skills that you bring to your job. But let's continue on the path of your career a little bit. Leaving the U.S. Attorney's Office and you go to AirTouch, what made you decide to go in-house at that point as opposed to going back to a law firm? Well, I think after you spent some time with the Department of Justice, you reach a point where you need to decide are you going to be a, a career prosecutor or go off and explore other things. And for me at that time in the Bay Area, there were a lot of new interesting things coming to the fore, new technologies, new business models and the like. AirTouch was an early mobile spinoff from Pacific Bell, then Pactel, and starting to focus on the notion of new kinds of ways people could work with what was then the novel idea of a mobile phone. This is before the the idea of smartphones had appeared to anybody. But the opportunity to start to work in these areas of of new technologies and new ways that people could use technology was very attractive to me. As a kid growing up in Palo Alto, I had 
I've always been fascinated by science fiction. We were playing video games before there was video in uh, working on teletype machines in the Palo Alto Unified School District offices. And, you know, hearing all the clatter in the background of teletype machines printing out the uh, how spaceships were moving through space. So I've always been fascinated by the social implications of technology and starting to work in an environment where there were new and different kinds of technology being becoming a part of people's daily lives was very exciting. So you have the cell phone when it's in its earliest incarnations that many of our younger listeners will probably not remember, actually, pre-smartphone. We can all recall when the flip phone became a big deal for us. Then you decide to go off in what I can only term as sort of first-generation internet world, Netscape, which then morphed into AOL. What was your, what was your thinking about leaping from AirTouch, which has its, you know, is a son or offspring of the Bell system, and I know exactly what that's like, to the fledgling internet? Well, this was a time where Netscape had just gone public the year before, so there was a lot of intrigue, but not a lot of understanding about what that business model might ultimately turn into. And the opportunity to move from a company that was in a pure communication space into a company that was just exploring a new way of communicating through internet browsers and the like was very attractive. And Netscape itself was a magical company. It never got to be more than three or 4,000 employees, but there was a sense of starting a, uh, a new wave of globalizing access to information for people around the world. The original Mosaic browser, which turned into Netscape, and then ultimately what people now know as Mozilla and Firefox as the open source version of that, was the first time people had really had a graphic user interface to access information on computers. Before that time, it was a command line control. You'd see a little prompt on your screen, a blank black screen with a little cursor blinking, waiting for you to put something in, as opposed to being able to move around with a mouse and explore the web the way we all are used to doing it now. So that opened up so many interesting legal issues, business issues, the creation of the internet as an international platform for the exchange of information. It was a very exciting time. And what were the sort of legal issues that you in particular were dealing with at Netscape and AOL? Was it on the commercial side or was it on the, the relationship with government? Because those are the days when the DMCA was coming around and those other issues that sort of formed the initial regulatory framework for the internet. That's absolutely right. Certainly there were commercial issues that were important. Netscape was struggling to get traction as an internet startup. And then ultimately the corporate issues involved in the consolidation with AOL. But at the same time, it really was the foundational era for internet regulation with, as you say, not the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, the Communications Decency Act, some parts of which were struck down by the Supreme Court, other parts of which became an essential form of safe harbor, which protected the ability of various kinds of internet platforms to allow people to share information. And it, not just in the United States, uh, Europe at the same time was coming forward with its e-commerce directive and privacy directives that set the framework that we still work under today. So being involved in all of those different areas, again, we were a, a small company, so not a, a significant player in the debate, but one that had obviously a point of view and was a way of illustrating the potential of this new marketplace. So it was a real balance across those things. We got involved in some of the earliest privacy issues. There were questions of the antitrust, the Netscape and Microsoft battles. In a sense, it was like being in, in Manchester at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. You didn't quite know what was happening, but it was clear that something was happening. And it ultimately led to what I think of as the information revolution led to the creation of information law, in a sense. If you look at categories like privacy and defamation, or some of the ways information is exchanged around the world and jurisdictional questions, intellectual property definitions, the limits on patents and copyright, new questions about antitrust and how that plays out in a digital economy. Those questions all started in the, in the 90s as the internet started to have traction in people's daily lives and in the way businesses were operating. So where you're at Netscape, it becomes AOL, and then you decide that you have been at one place for too long, and you jump again. Tell us about going to try to put TV on the internet before, a little bit before its time. Sure. Uh, and this was an interesting time. This was about 2001 when the internet bubble was just about to start popping, and a lot of startups in the valley uh, had a difficult time. 
So when I went from Netscape, I was looking for the new opportunity, Liberate, which is a joint venture between Netscape and Oracle, as you say, bringing the internet to television, but unfortunately doing it probably about 10 years too soon before a lot of the enabling technologies had been fully developed. And so that was the challenge. The company went from nothing and through an IPO to ultimately declaring bankruptcy after I had left. So it's, you know, in, in a sense, it's a, it's a pure Silicon Valley experience where you have the opportunity to get out and to try something. It doesn't go the way you hope it's going to go, but you move on to the, the next opportunity. In some ways, that's the definition of Silicon Valley, being willing to take the failures as well as the successes. And the next opportunity for you was eBay, which, you know, has become obviously one of the great Silicon Valley stalwarts. What was the transition there? Was it pretty seamless? Was there enough ferment that finding new opportunities was something that was relatively easy or this was post bubble pop? Was it it more difficult in that day? Well, at at that point, I was looking around. There was still a robust ecosystem of different companies in, in the sector. So I remember talking with not just eBay, but also Yahoo, Apple, and and others about different potential legal roles. And one of the attractions to eBay and the the work I took on there was focused on regulatory and litigation sorts of matters, was that they are, were and are a marketplace for the world, really an opportunity to try and bring some of the advantages of market exchange of goods and services to people pretty much everywhere. And one of eBay's points of success was to start in the United States, but very quickly go internationally through Europe, through Asia, through Latin America. And that's continued to work well for them. At the time, it was really just a question. It was a question of trying to figure out what does it mean to have a single marketplace across all these different jurisdictions, each of which have different rules about what you can and can't sell. And how do you articulate a, a standard that works across a platform when you have such very different legal systems. Well, bring us from eBay to Google then, and we'll figure out some of these other issues once we have you firmly placed in your current role in Google. How did that happen? Sure. eBay, in many senses, was great training for the time at Google in that, again, we have this international platform for exchange of information, but it goes beyond the sale of goods and services. Now it's the exchange of ideas, which is, if anything, even more prevalent. So when you're looking at the Google search capability, the Google's motto has always been organizing the world's information and making it universally accessible and useful. So that's an inspiring goal for all of us. That really is this notion of, you know, what do you have to believe to work at Google? You have to believe that knowledge is good, that access to information is good. And so the search engine is really the embodiment of that. And we work every day on questions of access to information, when is limiting information warranted, what are the procedural requirements you have to go through. But then we've gone beyond just pure search to have a wide variety of hosted content, platforms like YouTube or Google Docs and Drive or Blogger or various other tools. People use Gmail uh, to, to share information. And how should those be regulated? How do we work across continents to, to come up with a good balance there? So the, the Google team has grown over the years, and we've they had to deal with a lot of interesting new issues as they've come along. Some of them I alluded to before. Some of them new ones as the Internet has become more and more a part of people's daily lives and countries around the world are looking to figure out how best to regulate the benefits of the Internet without cutting off the opportunity for people to be able to exchange goods, services, ideas. In many ways, I think of the Internet as sort of like if you go back to the 1950s, there was the invention of the standardized shipping container, you know, those big steel boxes you see in, in ports. And people tend not to realize it, but the shipping container reduced the cost of global trade by 20 or 30 percent, probably more than any trade agreement that's ever been signed. And that was because instead of going through, you know, loading docks and, and coming off trucks and onto trains and off trains and, you know, off to a, to a warehouse and, and through ships and everything else, you could load something at the warehouse and deliver it to the, the retailer very smoothly and very seamlessly. And that dropped the cost of goods and services around the world significantly. The Internet is the equivalent of that standardized shipping container for digital goods, for digital services, and for ideas. It makes it seamless and easy for people to connect around the world using standardized protocols that allow an entire new generation of innovation on top of things like TCP IP that has allowed the entire world to connect in really new and interesting ways. 
Kent, your metaphor, the shipping container, is tremendous. Uh, it really does bring home the whole notion of the internet as a very, very basic aspect to our lives these days. But the other aspect of the internet is the continual disruption that it brings to almost anything that people hold certain, whether it's a company model or it's a vision of how government works or anything like that. And you've seen it firsthand, the disruption in Silicon Valley. Uh, I guess I want to ask, what are the biggest impacts that you've seen from the internet revolution as it comes to disrupting accepted norms of doing things? The temptation is to focus on the changes that we all experience, the ability to access information around the world, the ability to use a new generation of apps on our phones and in new mobile ways, which create more convenience, the ability to buy and, and sell things at lower prices with greater choice. And those are all great and important. But in a sense, the more profound change has been the ability to bring hundreds of millions of people around the world into a global community, to bring them out of extreme poverty. I think the number is, is six, seven hundred million people in the last 20 or 30 years alone. That's unprecedented in human history. And one of the biggest contributions of a more globalized internet-oriented economy. Now, the challenge, of course, is that when you're serving a global population, you create uh, lots of interesting legal tensions between different jurisdictions in which you're doing business. And that's important to focus on. When there are conflicts both within and between legal systems, getting that right isn't always easy. The issues that you point out about the global changes that are being affected by the Internet raises a sort of a series of challenges, though, for those individual countries. And what kind of threats do you see arising from that for the Internet as it is today? Quite a few, as you suggest. I mean, one is a desire for a, a new kind of digital sovereignty where each country creates the rules that govern itself and govern the version of the Internet platform that it has. The risk of that is a kind of balkanization of the Internet. If you really can't have information flowing freely between different countries, you lose the value of global exchange of information. And you go back into a notion of a, a much more limited and constricted kind of mini series of internets country by country. I think that would be a real loss for everybody. There are legitimate uh, issues, of course, that do cut across boundaries. And in most cases, the vast majority of countries align on standards for issues like security, uh, intellectual property, privacy, and the like. And where they don't, we need to work to try and calibrate as best possible. Of course, the security question raises the whole issue of encryption and cybersecurity. I know that Google has taken a strong stand on encryption, uh, and I think that the math seems to bear out that there's really no, no alternative to strong encryption on the Internet to make it a useful product for everyone around the world. But it also raises questions of whether there are aspects of the Internet as it is. I mean, we fear a balkanized Internet, but the Internet is anonymous. The Internet doesn't have any place where you are. All these things raise the level of potential cybersecurity problems. Should people be thinking about a, an Internet 2.0, or is that a fantasy that will never come about? I think the current Internet has actually been extraordinarily robust, and we've standardized it in many ways. That's not to say that it won't evolve over time. IPv6, a new generation of names for different sites on the Internet, for example, is a way that the Internet itself is evolving. Uh, but I think the, the most important part of, of the Internet is this notion of freedom of, of exchange and of access. So we are concerned with trends that we see, for example, in the, the right to be forgotten ruling coming out of Europe, which we have complied with, but now there are some who are calling for that to be implemented on a global basis so that a request for removal from one country would apply to all countries. And that feels like a race to the bottom, because if one country is regulating another, the second well, may want to regulate the first, and next thing you know, a lot of valuable information falls away from, from public access and, and availability. I think that would be a, a step backward. Uh, so we hope that the, the richness of the Internet continues, even as we address very real concerns about security, privacy, and the like. How do you see the utilization in some countries of apparently unrelated laws to try to deal with their internet issues. So antitrust in some countries has been raised, and Google has been in the focus of some of these efforts in a way to try to, in some respects, 
de-Americanize the internet from the way it is? Do you think that these are going to be successful? Do you regard them as significant threats? Well, there's almost a balance. If you have new wine. Do you put the new wine in new bottles or do you put the new wine in old bottles? And lawyers are, are used to the notion of trying to take existing laws and adapt them for new technologies. Every time you have a new technology, you probably don't need a new set of laws to go with it because most existing laws encapsulate a series of principles that where there's broad understanding and you have case law and, and many years of interpreting them to give good guidance to businesses and to, to people operating in, in the new environment. And that's, in a sense, what's going on now. I think many around the world are looking at the existing antitrust laws and saying, do those strike the right balance uh, for new forms of, of commerce on the net? There are a lot of sound principles that are built up in those over generations of, of learning and, and refinement. So it would be a shame to, to throw them away. At the same time, there's some who are saying, no, we need a whole new set of laws to deal with this, this new phenomenon. In some cases, I, I think our, our general approach is to say, let's be crisp about identifying the problem. What is it that's not working? And if there is something that's not working, why isn't it adequately dealt with under existing law? And in most cases, I think the existing laws will probably be found to be robust enough to address any legitimate concerns that are out there. You mentioned uh, the right to be forgotten, and uh, I want to turn the conversation to the whole question of censorship, because I think that it is interesting. We're in an interesting time here. Google you know, famously disengaged from China for a while and has been on the forefront of both the kind of nation-state efforts to limit the kind of information available and what I would call open invitations to private parties, like the right to be forgotten, to do that. Have you seen this is this on the rise? Is the nation-state aspect on the wane? What can we see in the future? What's your prognostication of where this is headed? Yeah, I think the best guide to the future is, is usually trends coming out of the past. And we were the first company to put out a transparency report, which lets everybody see the number of requests we get from governments for removal of content and for information about people who have posted content. We have seen those trends go up over time as the use of the Internet has gone up, and we're getting a lot of demands from a lot of different governments. That's to be expected, but the key for us has been to make sure that we are adhering to good standards of due process and procedural regularity, so getting court orders, getting lawfully authorized requests, making sure that things are, are done by the book. We think ultimately that's the right way of reconciling in a democratic society the legitimate law enforcement need for access to information and legitimate privacy concerns, which also need to be protected here. There is obviously a risk that either one of those can go overboard and frustrate the other. Do you think on this right to be forgotten that some enterprising uh, entity will sort of like a reverse WikiLeaks snap up everything that is alleged to need to be forgotten so it's available somehow, somewhere? Yeah, right to be forgotten is actually a, a little bit of a misnomer. It's actually a right to be delisted from search results. One of the unusual things about the right is that the underlying content stays up on the web. It's not taken down from the newspaper, for example, or the public records where it was originally posted. It's just that it becomes more difficult to find. I'm not sure how this is going to evolve over time. Even different countries within Europe have taken different perspectives on how best to interpret the right, uh, how broadly that scope should reach. Most people agree that it shouldn't apply to doctors who've committed serial malpractice or to people who have preyed on children in the past or other things like that. But there are legitimate disputes about how many years after crime is committed should it be delisted from search results, for example. There are not easy answers to those questions, and we continue to, to work through them as we figure out how to interpret this for a variety of different European countries. So it would have to be someone who would run a uh, an ersatz search engine to allow people to find it. Exactly. I mean, there have been efforts to try and index various requests. So of course, those efforts themselves arguably process personally identifiable information and could run afoul of, of European law. So you come back to some of these jurisdictional questions we talked about earlier as to how legitimate that would be for a company that's working in Europe as well. And, and to some degree, it comes back to the uh, request for a global implementation of a right to be forgotten. Because if you can ultimately track down the information, shouldn't you have to delist it generally, even though it continues to be available in the original source material? So it's a, it's a tricky question. It is a tricky question. One new aspect of censorship, though, that seems to have arisen with quite a lot of vigor in the last six months, I'd say, is what I can only term as self-censorship. You read about in some of the platforms that uh, are ubiquitous, 
Twitter and Facebook in particular, an effort that seems to be certainly well motivated dealing with ISIS and the horrors of that particular monstrosity seems to now to be evolving to sort of a being used to decide to take things off of Twitter and take things off of Facebook and perhaps committees built up in these companies to deal with that. How do you regard this turn towards self-censorship as opposed to the government-imposed censorship that we just talked about? I think many of these different platforms have had, since their beginning, a variety of different internal policies to deal with challenging content. And for, for Google, we have one approach to search, which generally tries to map all the content available on the web with very narrow exceptions, as opposed to user-generated content on a platform like YouTube, where we have always had policies like no pornography, for example, uh, or a variety of other things that were against our sense of what the YouTube community should be about. So that balance is always challenging to pull off because you want to create and maintain a, a rich and diverse place for new artists and citizen journalists and just everyday people who are looking for a platform to share their experiences. But at the same time, you want to avoid hate speech, you want to avoid threats, you want to avoid copyright infringement, you want to avoid porn, et cetera, et cetera. So we have tried to strike that balance and again, on the search side of the equation, be as strong as we can be in favor of the right to access information, which we believe is a fundamental human right. And then when it comes to hosted content, trying to strike a balance between the material that we think is ultimately useful for the community, drawing that boundary pretty broadly because there's a whole variety of different things that are on a site like YouTube, some of it which can be satire or parody or political speech that you know, might in some countries be deemed defamatory. But there we have traditionally had a, a series of policies to limit that. And I think you're seeing the same with some of the other internet companies driven by some of the concerns about terrorism in part, but it's sort of a maturation of the overall industry. Do you take a different look at some of these issues of terrorism and utilization of platforms in that way a little differently because of your prosecutorial background? Do you think that you know, you're of a piece with the other GCs out in Silicon Valley about how they view these things? No, I, I think we are very much on the same page. In the wake of the Snowden revelations, which created a false impression about some of the, the work that we had been doing and the idea that somehow we had not been pushing back uh, against government requests and or not requesting appropriate court orders, which was not true. We've always had a very rigorous process for reviewing requests we got. We and the other leading technology companies came together in a group called the Reform Government Surveillance Coalition, and we've made shared statements on a variety of issues of, of concern to people who are concerned about overbroad government surveillance, but while recognizing that you know, government surveillance is a part of ensuring security generally. We've worked actually together quite well on those issues. And where do you think that we'll end up with these self-censorship issues? And do you think that there's a slippery slope here? I've talked to some of the smaller companies, GCs, who are really concerned that there's a slippery slope and that we'll begin to mimic college campuses where there seems to be a limit on unpopular speech replicated on some of the more popular platform issues? Or do you think that this is going to even itself out and not going to be so much of a problem? Yeah, I think you will ultimately get to a stable equilibrium and there'll be different platforms that have different approaches to these issues. And that's as it should be. That's part of a competitive market. But we come at it from a starting point of being big fans of access to information, the ability to have free expression around the world, to share and challenge each other's ideas. And that's been a driving force behind the popularity of the internet, not just in the United States, but globally. So coming from that standpoint, the fact that there are some policy limitations on you know, certain things that uh, aren't appropriate for a given platform like YouTube, that's okay. That, you know, in the same way that different community fora might have rules about what's appropriate speech or you know, what crosses the line into hate speech or you know, threats of violence or whatever else. So long as you have those standards at the outside, you're actually you're trying to do that in furtherance of the larger goal of free expression. I mean, even in the United States, obviously, generally, no right to yell fire in a crowded theater or have other kinds of speech that are so challenging that they cross a certain line. Our job is to make sure that that line is as broad as can reasonably be. Kent, I want to thank you for spending time with us on In-House Legal. It's been a hugely informative half hour. Thank you. My pleasure. Good to talk to you, Randy. And I want to thank all of you who have listened to our podcast. 
For any of you listeners who would like more information about what you've heard today, please visit us at www.legaltalknetwork.com, or you can also follow us on iTunes, RSS, Twitter, and Facebook. That brings us to the end of our show. I'm Randy Milch. Thank you for listening, and join us next time for another great episode of In-House Legal. The views expressed by the participants of this program are their own and do not represent the views of, nor are they endorsed by, Legal Talk Network, its officers, directors, employees, agents, representatives, shareholders, and subsidiaries. None of the content should be considered legal advice. As always, consult a lawyer.